my name is Kevin Carey. I direct the, edu the education policy program here at the New America Foundation. Um, and let me just start by saying thank you uh, to the uh, representatives of our universities who were very generous with their time coming to spend the day with us, and to all of you um, for staying as well. Um, it's been a really interesting discussion. Um, uh, I've enjoyed all the conversations enlivened by some great questions from the audience. Um, so this is our last panel. Uh, it's going to be relatively short. Um, uh, I'm joined here uh, by Jeff and Hillary and Marguerite Rosa from uh, Georgetown University. Is that the best way to? That's yeah. right. Um, and what we wanted to do as kind of a final uh, a conversation was to come back to some of the original themes that we explored in the first panel um, about what it is that the universities that we studied and that were represented here today uh, are doing on behalf of the broad national interest in helping more students go to college and finish college with uh, valuable degrees. Uh, we talked a lot about scale uh, and this notion of what really big and growing universities can be. Uh, we talked about information technology. We had a couple of great panels about uh, relationships with faculty. Um, we've seen um, at a lot of the institutions, and, and all of us actually spent as part of the project, and there's a paper that was released today uh, that you'll find um, on our website. Uh, that was the result of a series of case studies and, and we spent uh, most of the last year uh, flying around the country and visiting a lot of these institutions firsthand. Um, we saw uh, strong relationships with uh, community colleges um, and really, and, and then a lot of the, the research that we talked about in the last panel. So it was really, what was striking from my perspective was uh, that all of these institutions were pursuing each of these very difficult aimed in concert with one another. Mm -hmm. They were very aware of how the research mission intersects with the mission of um, bringing more students to the campus, which changes the kind of faculty that you need, which changes the kind of relationships that you need to have with your community and partner institutions. It's a very complex system, and I'm always uh, impressed by the uh, indefatigable people who become university presidents, and yet they have time to come and talk to us today. So one of the questions that really uh, preoccupied us in doing this research and, and will continue to, uh, that we will continue to focus on going forward, because this meeting is not the end of this project by any means, is what can we do to um, incent, encourage, to help more public institutions pursue these kinds of strategies? Because one, one of the challenges of this kind of work is that the people who end up here on the stage are never randomly selected from the population of college presidents. We find them, in this case, uh, based on a statistical analysis of all the public research universities in the United States, finding those that were graduating students, that were uh, making efficient use of resources, that were growing even as their revenues were declining. Um, but that's not typical. Uh, th these are the institutions that we can learn from, but they're not typical institutions. And for us to really um, take seriously and to achieve the kind of policy goals that Jamie Marisota has talked about this morning, 60% um, of all American working age adults having some kind of credential in you know, what is becoming the near future. Uh, we're going to have to do, have what is now atypical will have to become common practice. And so one question I wanted to put to the panel to sort of wrap things up is what kind of um, public policies, what kind of communications efforts, what kinds of ways of thinking about higher education could contribute to that sort of scaling of practice? And so I'll start with Marguerite, um, who is one of the, really the nation's foremost experts on uh, education and money in all of its kind of intersections. Mm -hmm. um, and hope you could share a little bit about the research that you've been doing and then respond to those questions. Sure. I'll, um, I, I've been looking at the sort of financial structure of um, higher education and when I usually say that people usually mean the revenue side but I'm actually m more interested in the expenditure structure and how that expenditure structure is one that um, reinforces the kind of patterns that we're trying to move away from so um, we even talked in the last session a little bit about um, how do you get faculty on board? And um, the comment uh, was made that faculty aren't necessarily incented by the same things that everybody else, but nor are or they, or they're not incented by the things that the institution is seeking. Um, but they're not actually compensated on those either. Uh, many times they have a, a, a fixed salary that seems independent of, of workload or uh, productivity or 
um, uh, success with students or numbers of students taught or amount of research produced or any of the kinds of things that were labeled as, um, as goals. And so there's some um, curiosity about whether or not you could change the incentives or layer on a new set of incentives with incremental money over time that would actually um, get faculty into um, seeking the same kind of outcomes that their institution is um, prioritizing. So I think that's one whole area for opportunity. But um, another one that we've seen um, a lot is around state revenue structures for public institutions and what kinds of things they reinforce. And we're noticing um, that uh, a couple of papers that were out this morning, one on the excess credits. When state institutions um, fund excess credit taking in the same way that they fund um, uh, the needed credits, then we may over time see patterns of excess credit taking that are sort of subsidized from the state even though they might be inefficient for many reasons and unnecessary and relatively e easy things to change. So um, we mentioned in, in the paper some opportunities around changing uh, practices for one about state subsidy for those, but two then um, t changing institution behavior so that students take fewer of them or if they choose to take them they're not publicly subsidized. So that's um, uh, certainly one area for an opportunity. And another paper that you saw that we had produced was around whether or not changes in enrollment could be a revenue strategy. So um, uh, institutions, many of them have reacted to the downturn um, in by or, or the lack of state revenues by saying we'll go get more out of state students or we'll raise tuition. Um, and those are two um, uh, financially lucrative strategies and many of them have done that. But another one is simply to take in more students and, um, and not necessarily out of state students because all students come with some tuition dollars and if you take in more students you have more revenues at which point you're probably thinking well don't you also have more expenditures and that's where we get into this interesting question of well, uh, it's, it's probably unlikely that the scale, economy, the, the scale economies are such that each additional student drives up the expenditure structure proportionate to, to what the average per pupil cost is at an institution. And there are many ways you could put the institution to work at trying to figure out how if we increase the enrollment, then the individual units or colleges or departments get some share in that, and then they might change their delivery models in ways that can serve an additional student at a, at a pretty low cost. Um, that has this benefit for states, um, of course, of getting more graduates through the door, or more students through the door, and likely more graduates. So when we practically talked about that with universities, though, the biggest pushback was what happens to ranking. And, and so there's that whole, the whole discussion. And I think that's one we, we, we could talk about here, not necessarily a, a policy solution, but one that policy could um, impact over the long haul. Jeff, do you want to, you, uh, Jeff's the author of a great new book, College Unbound, um, available at fine bookstores, <laughs> ebooks, uh, amazon.com, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I know one of the things that you talk a lot about in your writing and thinking is, is um, what motivates higher education leaders. Marguerite talked about ranking, which kind of goes to questions of status. Um, is status something that we can bring to bear on this, on, this, on this challenge? Oh, I definitely think we need to, because we can't take status out of this conversation. Um, because status still matters. You know, there's this great quote that I, I came across in my research that, you know, prestige is to higher education as profits are to corporations. Um, and so there's this idea that something drives, uh, something motivates people in higher ed, whether it's uh, presidents, trustees, uh, alumni, uh, lawmakers, and faculty. And it's all trying to get to that next level. Uh, and there's this real inability, and we saw in our research in the, in, in the universities that we looked at, this ability, they kind of said, you know what, status matters to us, but we're going to still kind of pursue these policies because they're important for the state. But now we're giving them, you know, some status by, by including them <laughs> in, this, in this report, right? So, right? so it still matters to them. I mean, all of them were kind of excited about being in this, in this report. So we need to come up with some alternative, uh, some, and I hate to say another ranking because I don't think we need another ranking. But we need to have some sort of status, whether it's a, another uh, uh, AAU, another, uh, a, or another group of, of institutions that we can hold up on a regular basis as saying uh, they're able to serve the, 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 the needs of their state, whether it's on, on research or whether it's on students, 
And uh, they're still doing you know, quality research, quality education. They're increasing graduation rates, increasing uh, retention, and so forth. And, and so I, I think that to say status doesn't matter to these institutions, I think it does. OK. Um, we also, there's a role, I think, of uh, the government's play in the way that they regulate uh, colleges and universities. In addition to the main paper, there's a great uh, additional deep dive policy analysis on uh, state policy environments written by Iris Palmer. Iris, raise your hand from HCM Strategies. It's fantastic. Um, and that was something that actually impressed me uh, that I learned by participating in this project was we, particularly here in Washington, or if you're looking on the US news list, sort of think public research university, public research university. Uh, but when you go to the institutions, you really find that the state policy environment matters quite a bit. A public research university in one kind of system is in some ways a different organization than one in another kind. Some states are very uh, prescribed and controlling in, in the way that they regulate their institutions. Others are more laissez-faire. Um, and at the same time, we now have, I think, a growing set of questions being asked here in Washington, uh, which traditionally has, has not chosen or thought it was responsible for asking these kind of questions. Its role in higher education was basically to uh, fund research, uh, fund the Pell Grant, and get out of the way. Um, Hillary, can you talk a little bit about the role of public policy and where, that, where those kind of conversations ought to go? Well, I think you know it's an interesting moment because we will be, get, be beginning at some time over these next months discussions about reauthorizing HEA, the Higher Education Act. And wouldn't it be interesting if we put aside the piece of legislation that exists and rather than thinking about tinkering with this piece of it or that piece of it, started out with a series of hearings or conversations that were more, what does the country need from its higher education system today for the 21st century, given who our students are, given the growth of the of the country, given the point Michael Crow made that we sort of stopped our last great building time of colleges around 1950 with the exception of community colleges and, and allowed there to be more of a conversation about these big means. That's not to be naive about the ability for a piece of federal legislation to then be creative or you know, created new, but I, I think it's striking to me how out of step and really behind our public policymakers in Congress, especially probably a lot of the people um, in, in Congress are about all of the kinds of issues that we've been talking about today. And I think for the future of the country, uh, we have to figure out how to educate well the next generation um, students to a very high standard in a, in a, very, different, uh, a very different country. So I think from a, from a sort of national point of view, um, we need to figure out how to have that kind of conversation um, to establish almost the goalposts of what matters and then think about legislation moving backwards from there. Um, so I think that's one thing important. I think we will also, you know, faster than any of us wish or hope, be involved in yet the next um, presidential campaign um, for, yeah, I know, yet another uh, administration that will have a new president. So I think, you know, we should be taking the long view and, and, and understanding that many, many kinds of decisions or, or culture calibrating conversations will happen in this next to three to four year window. So what do we want those conversations to be about? And what images do we want to lift up about what the quote pinnacle of higher education should be? So when Michael said, uh, Crow said earlier this morning, you know, we keep coming back to that one pinnacle that's that narrow little group of elites that are that, that really in many, many ways are not that relevant to this particular uh, to this particular need. I think from a policy level, um, and then I think it would be much, it would be very beneficial to have more um, leaders of institutions in those policy discussions. Um, I was struck throughout our time um, in the interview process that many of the things that everyone focuses on at the federal level, the structure of accreditation, you know, the way the Pell Grants are structured, they matter to these institutions, but they're not the great be all and end all um, levers for change for them or uh, ways of helping them do more of what they need to do better. So I think it would be interesting to ask the leaders themselves, what would you need more of um, in order to be able to do more of the kinds of things that you guys are, are trying to do on behalf of the country? At the state level, uh, you know, I think um, really, really, really important for state legislators to begin to understand the public good of these place-based, you know, regional institutions and the role they play in their regional kind of ecosystems with community colleges and the K-12 system. And I think there's much pos positive movement there, um, the emphasis on completion, on performance funding, I think that's, that's faster and um, better targeted at the state level. Uh, 
but there too, I think we, there's a lot more that could be done to be um, proactive about the kinds of practices and strategies that we heard about here today. Last but not least, I think um, we don't need another college ranking. But it's really tempting when you hear someone like um, Chancellor Connolly say, you know, a lot of first generation students, we're now a college of choice, we're a destination of choice. Wouldn't it be interesting to figure out some way through uh, an advertising campaign or um, some kind of communication vehicle to get the parents of next generation students to ask much tougher questions about what colleges they want their students to go to if they really want them to be successful and to raise the status and the um, the stature of these institutions as destination colleges because chances are uh, they're going to be the ones that crack the code in what it means to, s to serve the students that we need to serve better really well. Is there a, uh, we're here in Washington so I'll ask like the easy Washington DC panel question which is there, is there a political dimension to this? This is to any of the three of you. Um, everything that particularly in these days uh, all these conversations tend inevitably to get refracted through um, you mentioned presidential politics, but uh, sort of larger ideological questions. Um, I, I mean, I'm always, one of the reasons that I tend to be optimistic about these conversations is that I tend to not um, detect any, a lot of politics in the broad goal of helping public institutions succeed and more people go to college. Uh, every, I've worked for elect, elected representatives, and it doesn't matter what side of the aisle you're on, you have a lot of constituents who want to be able to send their kids to college and not, don't want to bankrupt themselves to do it. Um, so are there, are there problems, are there opportunities as we sort of, as we stay in the, the policy realm, things we need to watch out for, whether it's on performance funding or, or new kinds of status or new sorts of relations with institutions? And how do we, what are the political elements of that? Well, I'll take one crack at that. Yeah. You know, I, I remember sitting in a, a Washington, the state of Washington has um, gathered together all the presidents of its public institutions for a big series of forums backed by the Seattle Times last year. And those, those presidents were absolutely tone deaf to the issues that we heard talked about here today by the presidents who were here. It was all about them. We, we should continue to exist because we need to exist, because we're the greatest thing that ever happened to the country, and we need more resources, and we need the public to value us. And there was, when they were done, um, there was a, probably 50 people lined up at the microphone because what they wanted to talk about was value for money and whether or not they, their, their students had access, whether they could graduate at a predictable time, whether tuitions were going to go up um, you know, unexpectedly. So I, I, I think to me what was striking today was to hear four presidents who did not coordinate their remarks at all speaking such an, owning such an incredibly different language. They'd already crossed over to, uh, a different kind of value proposition for higher education. And I, I think um, that is a politically powerful um, thing that's only going to accelerate. And I think that if, if higher education stays as tone deaf as many of the flagships and others are, are today, I think they will find eroding public support. I think one of the aspects of the universities that we looked at that kind of surprised me is that you know, universities tend to be conservative in terms of the way they think. Small, small C. Conservative. Yeah, thank you. Small C conservative. Um, but, but many of the universities, and Mark Becker, I think, talked a lot about this this morning, this idea of scale allows experiments. Uh, and there was a, what surprised me going into this project, some of these universities I knew pretty well through my previous life, but, but uh, others I, I met for the first time. And what surprised me about all of them was that they were willing to kind of take these chances on these experiments. Uh, and some of them were pretty public in terms of the experiments that they were conducting and might not work. Uh, so the stuff that Mark Becker was talking about this morning, where they would try something out, if it didn't work, they shelve it, try something else, change it, right? Most universities don't want to do that, right? Because they don't want to be publicly exposed to not knowing uh, what, they're, what they're doing in some cases, and, and, and they don't want to try these things out. And so I think that we need some way that universities can operate in somewhat of a safe space away from the criticisms of state lawmakers and federal lawmakers to try things out. Margaret, I want to put the question to you a little bit more specifically. So you uh, had a home at the University of Washington for quite some time, part of the research. Um, also a couple of great papers from Marguerite, also released today, um, also on our website and your colleagues, um, uh, uh, using some of that data. Um, university of Washington is a, a public research university that could have ended up on this list, but didn't. You know, well, um, didn't meet our criteria in terms of enrollment growth and all the rest of it. And you talked a little bit about these conversations you're having and rankings. 
Um, what, what are the other barriers? What would it take for some place like a university that you spend some time in to not just accede to, but embrace the kind of agenda that we've been discussing today? Um, so, so it's interesting when you said, so when we talk about the politics of it, I think the politics are shifting between the um, individuals in the institution who want it to stay the way it's always been. And um, for anyone, and I'm sure I'm not the only one in the room who sat in faculty meetings, you, you just, you, you know how many hours are spent resisting things that are coming down from the top and in different sorts of ways. Um, so the politics are, are very much about the, those that want to still keep this, even an outdated major that, that, or department that no one is signing up to take the classes and no one is, is majoring in, but there's this sense that we have to keep it for some other sort of reason. Um, and, and, the, and the politics of wanting to potentially change and increase the number of graduates and um, yield greater uh, return for dollar and those kinds of things. And, um, and I think that those tensions are very real, but if we look at them from another angle, I also th see sometimes if you if you look at big uh, these big institutions that haven't changed yet they're still very decentralized in the sense that these units think that they own the university and they and they do in many different ways and there's a potential to harness that um, in the sense that if we could um, find units that are interested and game and um, willing to try new things, we could cut them loose and let them free and try to build something new. And I think of the individual departments or the new program off offerings, we're seeing this a lot in institutions where the Office of Continuing Studies or, or whatever is the most profitable uh, or um, largest um, uh, number of students going through at lowest cost or um, it's the opportunity for the most entrepreneurial faculty to earn some additional money through this side program that they're doing. And um, in that sense, I think we might be able to unlock, even if the institution isn't, we might be able to unlock some of that innovation from inside it, which will actually then ultimately affect the in institution. And I think um, where possible, where the, if an institution not sure that they, the politics are on their side for opening up and going for, for these changes, it might just be enough to unlock some of that and let it happen. Uh, on the inside, and I'd say that's probably why I left University of Washington. Is I didn't, I didn't think it was willing to unlock and let that happen. And we heard before about like many faculty aren't interested in this for the money; they're interested in for the reputation or the. Or the and I, I think there are many of them interested in it for the money, and a lot of them are earning a lot of money on the side right now. And that, in a sense, there's a way to sort of embrace that um, mm -hmm. entrepreneurial spirit, even if it's with um, a subset of your faculty, and make it part of what the institution does. So I think there's a way to, way to do it that way. So this, you partially answered my next question. I'm going to ask one more question to the panel, and then we'll open it up to the audience, and we'll have a person with a microphone um, like last time. Uh, but it does seem like the faculty are a huge part of this equation. Um, as is normally the case in higher ed panels, we've invited no faculty to come and sit and participate <laughs> in this discussion. But that's OK. That's on me. Um, uh, a lot of our, our discussion in the faculty panel was about the um, relationship between research faculty and and everything else, which makes sense because this is a this was a project focused on research universities. But as we know, most students are not enrolled at research universities or universities that they may be at universities, but they're not universities that are really seriously in the knowledge production business, just objectively speaking. Um, and a lot of the implications about again the premise of our project was. Resources are limited. Our national need is growing. How can we become more productive? You know, lurking behind these fairly kind of benign or even positive words like productivity is labor productivity. And labor, pro you know, increasing labor productivity means labor is not getting paid as much as it would have if we hadn't increased labor productivity. Um, so it seems like a lot of the I anxiety don't know if that's about. True. Uh, I mean, uh, okay, maybe that's. I think we only <laughs> I, have ten I think minutes we can to go. go both but, ways with okay. that. Right. Um, uh, I have no, I. I I don't, how I don't do we, just, well, so um, how do we get the quote rank and file faculty, um, where, what's the place for them in this agenda is my question. Yeah, well I say cut them in on it. That's, right. that, I guess that's what I would say. And, okay. and I, I know many of them are, but right now um, if your salary is detached from your productivity, mm -hmm. then, the, then, the, then your statement will be true. But you could change the way compensation works and, and people are doing that with their side time already. Um, but I think even if we just talk about teaching and put a, a research aside, that we've, we've got our head set on this, we can either do an online course or we can do a traditional course. And I would say that some, somewhere in the path along there is a whole lot of stuff on the in-between. And that means that 
potentially, and I teach a niche subject, I'll admit, education finance is sort of a niche subject, but we c I could take just the subject matter I teach or that anybody else teaches and say, how can I use technology to potentially teach a whole lot more students in my niche subject? And we might say, well, there aren't a whole lot more students at this university who want to take, take this niche subject, in which case we could talk about scaling one set of expertise across other institutions. And I'll just give you an example from my own personal experience, which is I also teach at Rice University and teach um, uh, a, a program in, in um, Las Vegas and in some other places where students are aggregated, experts are brought in, and sometimes it's a two-week-long institute and I teach a two-day segment of it, or sometimes it's attached to somebody, some other institution's MBA and then the students get a stream in education leadership where they bring in the expertise, and the expertise can send in videos in advance and then we can come in and do an interactive part and then we can assign, do an assignment and they can email the assignment later. And the teaching can take on different forms that both uses the technology and also uses the in-person learning and that allows you to scale and also allows you to increase your own wages while increasing labor productivity. So it means there's a lot of things have to change in that equation but I can point to many different examples of how it's possible even right now. Um, <coughs> questions from the audience? Uh, yes, in the back. Peters Internship Institute. I wonder if you could just address this issue of youth unemployment. Uh, students today are coming out to a very changed job market, one that uh, we could um, hardly recognize. There are no real careers anymore. We, we're talking about students who will probably have to um, hope for an internship, even an unpaid one, uh, as the next step. And I wonder how our colleges are addressing this, because in the, in the good old days, uh, just a, a, having a degree was a, a ticket to, to a good job. Um, now work experience of a very specialized kind is usually required. So uh, do, do universities feel they have a responsibility to up their game, to change what they're doing, to prepare students differently because of this changed job market? I think one of the experiences that we saw at the universities we studied, and, and this was particularly true, I think, at the University of California at Riverside, was kind of using, uh, a, a, using research at an undergraduate level, so con kind of connecting students to the, to the research experience, so undergraduate research, uh, uh, experimental learning, so having the experience of, of, of kind of, whether it's co-ops or internships, kind of built into the curriculum. So I think that all the universities that we looked at where the curriculum is not uh, kind of this, the, the main thing and the job is on the side, but that the two were, were, were very much integrated, especially in the, in the learning communities, whether it's at Georgia State or, again, at UC Riverside. So we saw, I think, in the universities that we looked at, that the curriculum is really meant to not only broadly educate the students, but also to prepare them for, for their chosen career. And I think we also heard from the presidents that, that, that having internships, letting students have access to, to internships out in the community, um, while they're in college, so paid work, is an increasing differentiating factor. You know, that's, that's something that increasingly parents and students themselves are, are looking for and comparing institutions between. So theoretically, that's a place where a great regional research university should have a, a comparative advantage. But it would take, uh, again, like this in-between space that Marguerite was talking about before, conceptualizing a major or a field of study so that it included um, partnerships with uh, companies that were trying to solve real world problems or opportunities to work and that's a there are lots of different ways that different institutions organize themselves to try to help make that easier and more powerful um, so I think that that's that's definitely a frontier that needs um, innovation and expansion and you know the the real youth em employment problem just to digress totally from this topic is much less for the students that are in some kind of two or four year institution and much more for the students, the young people who don't go to any um, institution at, at all. Uh, but I think colleges and universities could do a lot more in the internship arena. Yes. Uh, Jim Snyder, a former New America fellow and somebody who's written uh, on education uh, issues fairly frequently for Education Week and Washington Post and several others, popular type of uh, articles. Um, my question uh, relates to um, uh, the relative opposition to these productivity-enhancing uses of new technology 
in the K to 12 system versus uh, universities. So we know in K to 12, there's tremendous, in many districts, union opposition to these productivity enhancing tools, online education, because they're very disruptive in a lot of respects. And I'm wondering, you've, uh, occasionally it's been mentioned with, uh, with the public universities, also unionized. Um, I get a sense that the, the level of opposition is actually much less in, in the university space than in the K-12. to And I was wondering if you also had that feel uh, or if there are s similar obstacles. How would you compare the level of union opposition to these productivity enhancing um, tools in the K-12 to space versus the unionized uh, university space? Well, it, it uh, first of all, really depends on the labor environment in the particular state. So uh, it wasn't that long ago that there were some um, uh, discussions and conversations, proposals in California uh, to uh, make online learning more available. And the uh, president of the Cal State Faculty Senate came out and said, we're not, we're not in favor of that. We're not going to put up with it. We're not going to agree to it. We feel like we have veto power over those decisions. And, and academic labor in California is heavily unionized at the post-secondary level. Um, we tend to think of, of K through 12 as the unionized part of our education system. And in, in higher education, everyone's a free agent. But that's not true. Um, in some places it is, and in some states it is. But in some states it's not. Uh, I also think that, that uh, um, Marguerite spoke to this a little bit, that there is a lot more flexibility, both in terms of career path and source of compensation um, at the post-secondary level. Now, some of that flexibility is really rebounded against labor, where you find this big pool of, of adjuncts kind of scraping together a, liver, a living on what amounts to food stamp wages. Um, but at the same time, um, there's not as much institutional control, and roles are not as heavily defined. So in K through 12, you're never going to teach, hopefully, if all goes well, more than like 35 students or so at a time. I mean, that's the model we have, and that has a lot to do with the uh, developmental progress of children, particularly children at the young level. I think this conversation changes substantially at the high school level, where there really is um, a lot of these conversations that we're having about lower post-secondary are substantially ap applicable to upper secondary, a lot of the same classes, a lot of the same models. Um, so I think, I mean, from my perspective, I think those are, those are the things that are sort of uh, driving. And increases in productivity at K-12 really might just put you out of a job. Whereas in higher ed, there may be all kinds of different um, uh, arrangements where you could find some other place for yourself. They also uh, might not be publicly as objectioning, uh, ob objecting, yeah. but uh, just as effective at objecting and saying, eh, we're not going to put that <coughs> into place. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's a great point. So you, in, on the K-12 through level, you might have one person who speaks on behalf of 10,000 people um, with a very strong and clear public voice on higher ed, you might have 10,000 people, each of whom have agency within, but it, it comes much more on a department by department or institution by institution level. Uh, we have time for one more question, if there is one. No? OK. Uh, I, again, let me just, uh, on behalf of the New America Foundation, thank you to all of our panelists and to all of you for coming.